Okay. Uh, this evening, we're going to be discussing Buddhist ethics, and this might be considered a back to basics Buddhism on one hand. Um, and as you'll see, we're not going to be breaking any new ground about Buddhist ethics. So there's, there's no, uh, um, what's the right term? I'm forgetting the term. There's no, no, revelation. Well, there are no revelations, <laughs> but we'll leave it there. Um, but it's a review of what we should know about the Buddhist path, and it's my intention to place what we know in a slightly different context, a context that may clear up what I've seen as a misunderstanding about Buddhism um, from those people who are in a post-industrial, non-Asian worldview. And I've tried to keep it short to encourage questions at the end. And so to begin with, we should just have a common understanding of what is ethics. First, ethics refers to the well-founded standards of right and wrong that prescribe what humans ought to do, usually in terms of rights, obligations, benefits, society, fairness, or specific virtues. And there should be, yeah. There should be more. There should be more. The second, ethics refers to the study and development of one's ethical standards. Um, what is ethics? As, it, as I say, it's the moral philosophy dealing with what's, what's good and bad, and the moral duty and obligation. Um, how should we live? Should we aim at happiness or at knowledge, virtue, or the creation of beautiful objects? If we choose happiness, will it be our own or the happiness of all? Can we justify living in opulence while elsewhere in the world people are starving? Is going to war justified in cases where it is likely that innocent people will be killed? Is it wrong to clone a human being or destroy human embryos in medical research? What are our obligations, if any, to the generation of humans who will come after us and to the nu numerous non-human animals with whom we share the planet? These are all issues that we consider ethical, and it doesn't matter what society one, one lives in, that's basically the, the purview of ethics. Next slide, please. And what is it that's different about Buddhist ethics? There are general guidelines that virtually all societies agree upon. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, etc. And societies differ in how these guidelines are interpreted. They also change over time in the environment in which they're situated. The Abrahamic traditions assert <clears throat> that morality and by extension ethics have been established by a monotheistic Hashem or God or Allah. And over the 25 years ago, and this is what really made it come to my attention, uh, I hadn't thought about what's the difference between Buddhist ethics and non-Buddhist ethics. But about 25 years ago, after Schumann and I had returned from Japan and found the current Tendai Dharma Center, now known as TBI, Tendai Buddhist Institute, I was asked to speak at a congregational church in Monterey, Massachusetts. And they were doing a series. The, the pastor of the church then had different people from different traditions come in and speak about their tradition great series of, of uh, lectures from that church's perspective. So everything's going along well. I gave my dog and pony show, and, and um, I finished and asked if there was any questions. And I got some questions that were really sort of right on the money. But then I had one that sort of threw me for a loop. And the person who was asking was a, a, a gentleman who said, um, well, you know, I took a comparative religion class when I was in college, which was probably 50 or 60 years earlier. And uh, I remember at that time, the professor telling me, well, the difference between Christianity and Judaism, the, et cetera, and Buddhism is that Buddhism has no morality. <laughs> there are no laws, no moral laws. And I said to him, um, well, I don't think that's quite true. I didn't want to say what the 
Scrap your list. But I, I, I said, no, I, I don't agree with that. Um, there's, it's filled with, with um, ideas of morality and ethics. And, uh, you know, I gave them some examples. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. <laughs> and I said, yeah. He said, they, only God can determine morality. And you already told us that Buddhism is non-theistic, which means there is no inherent God. And so therefore, how can you have morality and ethics? I'd never, I'd never really, I'd never, I never really thought of it that way. I'd never been confronted with it that way, at least. And so, I mean, my my thought was always, and this is coming from you know a, a anthropological background. I'd always thought that human beings are by nature moral, and from an ethic, from a evolutionary perspective, that's one of the things that one of the criteria for human evolution is that we cooperate. We are humans are cooperative, although one would note if you happen to be watching. Congressional views today. Human beings are cooperative, and they we were able to uh, evolve because of, of that sense of cooperation, which includes morals and ethics. That's really where morals and ethics are founded from an evolutionary perspective. So I, I found it really interesting to to recognize that there is that sort of an opinion, and so to many people. They would feel that Torah and the Leviticus and Deuteronomy and the other places, Genesis, where you find um, moral and ethical codes, is the basis for uh, ethics and morality within the Abraham, Abrahamic traditions. And and while that particular gentleman, I, I I'm not sure that he would come here on a Wednesday night. By the way, while that particular gentleman. Uh, was I, I tried not to to chastise him, but just to inform him. Uh, I'm not sure that he was a lone thinker in that. I think that there's a lot of people who make those assumptions that the Abrahamic traditions um, are really the basis, the foundation of moral and ethical guidelines. Um, whereas in the Dharmic tradition, there are other sources, not biblical, the Bhagavad Gita. The Matsurti, the Purnas, the books of Niti are attributed to a mythical uh, author and a compiler, Vasya, through Ganesh. Ganesh is one of the, that's the elephant figure mm -hmm. that you often see. I, Ganesh, by the way, don't get me started on Ganesh, uh, because in esoteric Buddhism, Ganesh is a real, is a real heavy hitter. You got you to be, be careful when you're dealing with Ganesh, mm -hmm. just, just to let you know. However, Vaisa is not considered a god, but a compiler of the materials given indeterminately by various tales of the gods. Jainism is a religion originating in India that offered a distinctive moral vision centered on nonviolence and asceticism, and the ethics are based on major and minor vows taught by Mahavira and other prominent founders of the religion. Buddhist ethics are traditionally based on the enlightened perspective of Shakyamuni Buddha and were further developed by his disciples and other well-regarded teachers. <clears throat> Nikaya Buddhism, based on the Pali Canon specifically, <clears throat> the Silakanda Vaga, Pali, the division concerning morality and informed by the Vedic sensitivities, while the Mahayana source of ethics is a Sanskrit canon that was further informed by a combination of influences that represent a reliance on bodhisattva conduct. In many ways and commentaries. Kuhn writes, there are enough references to precepts, virtues, and moral models to suggest that Mahayana Buddhism involves a moral perspective, not merely as a worldview, but directly as a system. The specifics of each of the trends is highly dependent upon whether they're located in South Asia, East Asia, Tibetan, uh, or other societies. And as I say in the handout, fundamentally, we find that do not, not to do any evil, to cultivate what is wholesome, to purify the mind, that is the teaching of the Buddhists from the Dhammapada. And for this discussion, I'm going to focus on the East Asian teachings with an understanding that these ethics encompass the Nikaya teachings that were, are refined to express a more expansive ethics directed to the laity and clerics of life. Like 
while the Nikaya teachings included um, the four groups at that time, the Bhikshu Bhakshini, the lay men and lay women, the, each of those groups had their own specific set of codes of ethics. Um, well, the lay men and lay women, the, 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 the codes were virtually identical, but for the cleric men and women, they were different. Um, and there's a difference when we get to the Mahayana, which we'll discuss in just a second. So what are Buddhist ethics? Well, this is going to look very familiar to you because you start with the Eightfold Noble Path and three out of the eight elements of the Eightfold Noble Path are Shila, which is specifically morality. And you'll see the right speech, right action, right livelihood are inherent in this. The divisions of the path are broken into virtue, meditation, and wisdom, always given in that order. It's interesting that the Eightfold Noble Path is in this order with right understanding, right aspiration, right intention will be the other, other term for that. Um, and then you have the, the three, the, the right speech, right action, right livelihood, and then the final three are, as you see, right effort, mindfulness, and concentration. But when you read the sutras, they always start with virtue. That I always found that to be sort of a, I wasn't sure quite how to, to square that. You know, it's, it's really interesting to me. Um, I guess I'll have to use a time machine, but Dr. Who hasn't shown up for a while, so I can't really ask you. Um, a person's first commitment will be to develop a virtue, a generous and self-controlled way of life for the benefit of self and others. The virtue, meditation, wisdom sequence, spirals up to a higher level. Meditation strengthens virtue, and virtue provides the foundations for meditation. You'll recall that I've said many times when, when Chigi in the 6th century is asked, well, how do you begin meditation? He says, first, you have to follow Shila, or morality and ethics. That's the way you begin meditation. Um, and then wisdom, namely a deep understanding of the Four Noble Truths, which is right understanding, and right intention, which has two levels. The mundane level, the intent, includes being harmless and desisting from ill to any being, as this accrues karma and leads to rebirth. And at the super mundane level, which is above the, that would be the provisional and the absolute, at the super mundane level, the factor includes a resolve to consider everything and everyone as impermanent. A source of suffering and without a self. So in one sense, you have the three that are directly attributed to um, Sheila, speech, action, livelihood. But then when you look at wisdom, you realize that there is an ethical component to wisdom also. The greatest differences we see between Western ethics and Buddhist ethics is the inclusion of right livelihood and right speech as an ethical concern. A Western perspective addresses right action as a primary concern, and right action is broad and not descriptive from a Western perspective. And we can understand Buddhist precepts as the particulars of Buddhist ethics. I think that's one of the things that really um, is difficult for some people to understand, is the, the idea that the precepts are, as, are the form of ethical and moral, and moral guidelines. We can understand Buddhist practice as the particulars of Buddhist ethics, and there are many forms of the precepts depending upon the form of Buddhism and one's practice. And thus, when we talk about precepts, there are many, many different forms of precepts. And so that's one of the distinctions between why do South Asians have an ethics that's delimited in one way, whereas East Asian ethics might be delimited in another way, partly because they have different precepts that they follow. Now, those precepts are complementary in the two systems, and you could include Tibetan in that also. They're complementary in those systems, but they lead to slightly different um, outcomes. And it's really interesting when you read the literature uh, by scholars on Buddhist ethics, from people like, um, well, I, I put it on the, uh, there's a bibliography at the end of the handout, 
just looking at the, this particular uh, set of folks, you'll see that they're, you know, Cohen and Harvey and uh, Osuka, you'll see that they actually get pretty involved in some of the distinctions between the poly precepts, hence the poly idea of morality and ethics, contrasted to the, the Sanskrit uh, ethics um, that you find in East Asia and in, and in Tibet. So this is where this, the interpretation of a situation occurs. Now, the precepts you might, you might even suggest are not some of the delay precepts, for instance, are not so different than the Ten Commandments. You've got everything in the five precepts, lay precepts, is found in the Ten Commandments. Now, actually, that's not true because um, sexual misconduct isn't found in the Ten Commandments. Except that one should not cover one's covered. wife. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't say a lot of other things. A lot of other things. <laughs> 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 so it, you, you do find you do find sort of correspondence uh, to those. On the other hand, when you get into the ten precepts, which we'll discuss later, then you find um, a difference. But I think that one of the distinctions is that how we interpret those things. I mean, let's just take a, a very obvious uh, ethical, moral uh, underpinning within the Abrahamic traditions, which is, is should abortion be permitted or is abortion restricted? You know, it depends upon which Christian you ask, <laughs> right? Oh. Well, it's no different in it's no different in Buddhism. So Buddhism is going to have a plethora of ideas about that based upon differences in traditions. Um, some would say, no, abortion is always forbidden. Other forms of Buddhism say, no, it's absolutely permitted. Uh, it's, it's um, what's the right term? It's a sad commentary that abortion is necessary. On the other hand, from, from that Buddhist perspective, you shouldn't obligate a woman to carry a child whom she couldn't care for, didn't, didn't request or whatever, et cetera. You know, that, that's, that's one of the differences. And just to bring this, how do we internalize this in the 21st century? And there's a really wonderful uh, source online that people may or may not be uh, aware of, and that's the, the Buddhist, uh, the ethics of, what is it called? The Journal of Buddhist Ethics. And when you look at what they address in the Journal of Buddhist Ethics, and like I say you can find it online, just type in Journal of Buddhist Ethics, you'll come up with it. It's a peer review publication. Uh, it's been published for about uh, well, a little bit over, uh, probably close to 30 years now. Um, some of the topics that they tell the, the uh, people who are going to submit publications to address are Vinaya and jurisprudence, Vinaya being the code of discipline in, in Buddhism medical ethics, philosophical ethics, human rights, ethics and psychology, ecology and the environment, social and political philosophy, cross-cultural ethics, ethics and anthropology, and interfaith dialogue on ethics. Those are the topics that they specifically address in that journal. And like I say, take a look at it. If you can't find, if you've got nothing else to do, or you're just genuinely interested, go looking for it. You know, some of the best writers in Buddhism have published in that in that particular um, outlet. Um, in other words, the Eightfold Noble Path contains the basis for Buddhist ethics that are then ex expanded upon as the situation is stipulated. Further, this model is consistent for all of Buddhism. As the Mahayana developed, there was a further expansion, as we will see in both sutra and in commentary. And in Mahayana ethics, there's a distinction, and it expands what is the notion of ethics to include temperance or restraint, pursuit of the good, and altruism. Karma is at the center of the discussion of morality and ethics in the Mahayana, as it is in, in the Pali Canon, along with the idea of selfless compassion, karuna. It's the bodhisattva selfless compassion coupled with wisdom, prajna, and skillful means, upaya, 
that compels them to remain in the world to aid other other beings. So in this in this understanding of ethics from a Mahayana perspective, the very nature of the bodhisattva is an is based upon an ethical and a moral imperative, which is one of the things that uh, the scholars would use to distinguish the Mahayana from the Nikaya Buddhist uh, perspective. The text, Perfection of Wisdom, the Prajna Paramita Upadesha Sutra, seeks greater emphasis on wisdom, but also warns us to avoid excess of it. That may sound strange, that there's an excess of wisdom. And I'm not going to untangle that for you. Uh, morality in Mahayana is distinguished by its comprehensive classification and scope, which can be encapsulated in the three factors that are on the slide. The Fan Wang Xing, translated by Kumara Jiva in the 5th century, uh, is really the basis for Mahayana ethics on a very real level, including uh, the 10 major and 48 minor bodhisattva precepts, um, which are now normally taken uh, in China in one way uh, as a third set of precepts by monks and nuns. And lay Buddhists in China also take a different bodhisattva set of bodhisattva precepts from the Upshaka uh, Sutra. Uh, the precepts of the Fan Wang Xing came to be the sole precepts taken by certain Japanese clerics following the petition by Saicho in the 8th century, or 9th century, and that Tendai monks are not required to take the Vinaya precepts. So in Japan, the Brahmajala Sutra is the force, is the um, source of the 10 major and 48 minor precepts that are taken by Japanese monks and nuns. And Interestingly enough, while there's a difference in China between lay folks and the Shaka Sutra in China, in Japan, the laity is also can also take the um, uh, ten major and ten minor precepts. And part of this may well, I, I won't get into that. That that's getting deep into the weeds, so I'll I'll skip that. But just to let you know that 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 becomes a major form of ethical and and moral. Uh, understanding within the Mahayana. And of course, the Fan Wan Ching was translated by Kumar Jiva from the Sanskrit. And it, as is most sutras, it's attributed to Shakyamuni Buddha, though its authorship is really unknown. And this became the, the Fan Wan Ching, became very important text to Jigi and is referenced throughout the Mahakishikan and other works. And for those who have been attending the Mahakishikan um, tutorials, you know, it seems like at least once a week, the five, the Fan Wang Ching is is mentioned at least in a footnote. We can see in the Chinese translation, apocryphal to this apocryphal text references scholars attribute to Confucianism. So there is no extant Sanskrit version of the Fan Wang Ching uh, today. What we have is the uh, version that was translated by Kamar Jiva, that, and that would have been the, the version that uh, Chigi was, uh, was using. And what's interesting is that we can see within that work how, in this case, we, we talk all the time about how Taoism and Buddhism intertwined and affected each other um, in various ways. Here's one of the examples where Confucianism had a profound effect on Buddhism, and Buddhism undoubtedly had a profound effect on Confucianism because, well, again, I won't get, get into, into that bed of weeds, but um, in a very similar fashion. So Confucianism during that period of time developed into what is known to scholars as Neo-Confucianism, which, which had a, a profound effect on uh, the imperial, the Chinese imperial realms and that sort of sort of thing. Um, and so the ethical works transform, <coughs> transformed Japanese Buddhism from the time of Saicho, because that was one of the things that Saicho brought back with him and made a centerpiece of, of Tendai Buddhism from Tiantai Buddhism. What I'd like to point out is 
precepts became the operational form of ethics as determined by Buddhism, and how these precepts are interpreted is left to each of the Buddhist schools and trends to interpret. Next, please. I told you I was going to make this short this evening because I hope there's some good questions. If not, you're all going to have to stay behind and write an I essay. Write on the board 100 yeah. times. So, um, Saicho's disciple, as I wrote in the, um, the handout, wrote that the one mind precept is of supreme importance. It reflects the integration of the various teachings, such as the Lotus Sutra, esoteric practices, Shikan meditation, and the precepts into a comprehensive body of Buddhist knowledge. He identified the essence of the natural mind with the precepts. In other words, and when one has combined the precepts, ethics, with meditation, other wholesome practices, and sutra study, one has purity of mind that is their original nature. And this is the basis of Buddhist ethics. The Bodhisattva, the, in conclusion, Buddhist ethics are not a component of Buddhist teachings. They are integral. They come about through the phases, all phases of Buddhist teachings, practices, and study. The Bodhisattva path itself is intended to liberate all sentient beings from suffering, the shadow of dukkha, and to experience the very nature of reality. This cannot be done without adherence to ethical behavior. Next slide, please. And of course, this is the year of the rabbit. So enjoy a peaceful and serene year of the rabbit. And now if you have any questions, thoughts, or comments. And by the way, that's a good looking rabbit. <laughs> I, I, you know, this last, I, I've got to tell you, this last year, from spring until uh, late fall, we were rover run by rabbits in this area. I don't know how this this year, 2023, can be more the year of rabbits than last year. <laughs>